Well, welcome to uh, any folks that may have logged on early here. Uh, my name is Jeff Jensen, uh, Field Coordinator, Program Manager with Trees Forever, and I'm here with uh, my colleague Brad Riphagen, who is also a Field Coordinator and Program Manager. And uh, hey, we're excited to uh, take you on a whirlwind tour of Prairie through the seasons. So um, just real quickly here, uh, as we get more folks that log on, uh, we'll be giving you some instructions. Uh, you should be able to hear us, see us for now, and hopefully see the screen. Um, and if there's any issues that you can't see or hear us, uh, let us know in the chat box or the questions box. So those are the two ways that you can communicate with us. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. It's a lovely sunny day here, Jeff. Yeah, cold and sunny. Well, Brad, should we take turns singing Christmas carols? Is the season uh, started? <laughs> yeah, you start. <laughs> I was going to you. Yeah, exactly. That's why I said it first. Because <laughs> it's, yeah, no, no, that's not a good thing. Not a good way to start this presentation, Jeff. <laughs> Should probably have some sort of prairie tune or something. Yeah, good point. Good point. So, do you uh, put up Christmas lights in the whole nine yards, and uh, oh, do you exactly have you put some. them up yet? Oh, some of them. It's kind of a process. Sure. What's left? What's left is the tree, basically. So the tree is live, sitting in the garage in a bucket of water, waiting to go up. So we'll purchase well, that with the grandkids. You. Yeah. Mind you, yes. a live tree. Absolutely. Yeah. Excellent. I mean, it, the frustrating thing for me, and I don't know what other people do, but me and lights putting on the tree is always the struggle. So sure. yeah. that's the one benefit I could see from an artificial tree. The smell well, of, a fir, of a fir tree is like amazing. And if I don't have that, I it's not Christmas. <laughs> Amen. I agree. <laughs> yeah. So my uh, parents have used an artificial tree for more than a decade now, and um, we had a live tree growing up as, as kids, but uh, as they've gotten older and not wanting to deal with all that, uh, they went to an artificial one and one of these that had like fiber optic ends that light up, so you don't oh, even yeah. necessarily have to put any lights on it on it either, um, which, which is interesting. Um, and now it's at a point where there is no way my mother will give that up because she is going to milk every last ounce out of that tree because every year she comments, oh, this tree, this is year 15, 16, whatever it is, and it still works, Whoa. and oh, my goodness gracious. So, who knows? Well, so, but that's good, though. At least she's not going out and buying a new one every couple of years. So That's true. And then for my house here, I just go out and um, I just uh, top off the top of one of the conifers, make a nice little short tree that's about three feet tall. And... Oh, no, I'm Is kidding. Going to one of the neighbor's windbreak trees? Is that what you're telling me? No, no, no. Because what's one of the golden rules? We don't top trees. However, uh, I do have a couple of conifers that I'm in the process of removing um some things on the farm here cleaning up from a prior owner and so uh like full i mean i totally have limbed it all the way up to the point where all that's left is i have three of them <laughs> so yeah well you probably probably need to open it up this the air around some of them if they're spruce so exactly so, so look at you managing for your your needs but that's just it what is the goal what are your needs and so yeah. you manage according to those. So I am not trying to manage specifically for three to four foot Christmas trees that you can sit on top of your <laughs> countertop or your uh, coffee table, but it just happens that well, that's one of the results of that management. So. 
and it would be difficult to see. So I have a 15 foot tall tree. I have to climb 10 feet to cut off my four to five foot tall. <laughs> well, when you have a tractor in a bucket, it really helps. So. Oh, true. There, there's, oh. Uh, OSHA's not on, are they? <laughs> so it looks like we got some more folks um, uh, that are starting to file in here. Uh, welcome, my name is Jeff Jensen, uh, Field Coordinator Program Manager with Trees Forever. Um, so you should be able to hear myself and certainly see the camera and the screen prairie through the seasons. Uh, if you can't, the way to interact with us is through the questions or the chat box. Uh, so you uh, you can, should hear us, but we can't hear you uh, uh, through the webinar. So if there are some issues, uh, please let us know. Um, we'll try to troubleshoot as best we can. There is an alternative phone number for those that have trouble with their computer um, camera or audio, uh, you could always call in as well. Uh, we'll be getting started in uh, about four or five minutes here as uh, some additional folks uh, filter in. Um, Merry Christmas, happy holidays, yeah, it's, it's time. Nice. Thanksgiving's in the rear view mirror, so. Yeah, definitely, definitely strange. But we'll do what we can to keep the spirits up, right? It's for sure. Actually, drinking apple cider, Jeff. There you go. Out of oh, my hot cup. For those of you who are Hawkeye fans. <laughs> hey, it was a great weekend. We had two wins on Friday yeah. with Iowa and Iowa State. And the old Vikings came from behind and really got her done, too. So it was a happy <laughs> yeah, day so, in our household. Same here. Just for those of you poor people that don't know, Jeff and I kind of are the the Viking fans on the Trees Forever staff. So. And full disclosure, we looked at some of the participants and saw that most of them were from Eastern Iowa. So uh, without too many Western Iowa folks here and the threat of perhaps a Nebraska Huskers fan, we can talk pretty <laughs> uh, joyously and boisterously about the Hawkeyes. Yeah. Well. Yes, we can. <laughs> I don't think we have anybody from, let's see, who did the, wait a minute, who did Iowa State beat on? Um, well, that was the Texas Fridays. game. Texas game. Okay. Yeah, I don't think we have any Texas folks on. So, okay. Well, we're getting a few more folks coming in. Welcome. Uh, this is Jeff Jensen, program manager, field coordinator with Trees Forever. I'm here with my colleague uh, Brad Riphagen, uh, also program manager, field coordinator. And uh, we're going to be getting started here in just another couple of minutes. Uh, we've got a little over half of the folks that registered, so good, good. They're coming in now, and of course, at the last minute is when most folks will log on. Uh, so just a couple of nuts and bolts. You should be able to hear us and see us. Uh, if not, uh, you'll need to communicate with us through the chat function on your um, GoToWebinar box there or the questions um, option because we cannot hear individuals or see individuals. So uh, again, if you have any questions throughout the, uh, the presentation, uh, go ahead and type them in. We'll respond if we can, uh, if it's something that we need to bring to the group. Uh, well, we'll go through all the questions at the end, certainly. Um, so just ask away. Okay. Couple more years, Jeff. I can do the Santa thing. Will you? Does Santa come to Jefferson? No, I don't. If he does, I don't usually see him. I mean, he's kind of on the down low. He does sneaks his way in and sneaks his way out. Right? Have the grandkids gone to see Santa or not yet? Uh, no, I don't know if they're gonna. I mean, well, plus there's, you know, does he wear a mask? Do they wear a mask? They're not gonna be going probably. No Santa's this year. Yeah, they've been playing a pretty Elf on the shelf. Place. It'll have to be Elf on yeah. the shelf. I see. Yeah. yeah. They've been in the past, so. But this has not been this Santa. Okay. Well, I have 12 noon, so I think uh, we'll go ahead and get started. I know that we'll have some folks that'll filter in. Uh, this is being recorded, so there will be an opportunity for anybody that misses uh, introductions and the such to come and, and see. 
uh, when they view it later. My name is Jeff Jensen. I'm a program manager and field coordinator with Trees Forever. I work up in Northwest Iowa, and I'm here with my colleague, Brad Riphagen, who's also a program manager and field coordinator handling Southwest Iowa. So the Western contingency of uh, Trees Forever is, is here with you today. So I'm going to uh, be quiet here in just a moment. Uh, I just wanted to go over a, a few nuts and bolts. Uh, if you've been on the line or if you've been on with us for the last couple of minutes, you've probably heard this three or four times already. But just a reminder, you should be able to hear us and see us. Uh, we cannot hear you or see you. So if you have any issues, uh, please communicate with us through the chat function or the questions box. Uh, again, we're going to get started. Questions can be typed into the questions box. If it's something that we're in a, a spot where we can just ask Brad or, or answer it, we'll do that. Otherwise, uh, at any rate, at the very end, we'll go through all of the questions and be sure we get them answered uh, for folks. Uh, with that, Brad, I'm going to turn it over to you. Excellent. Thanks, Jeff. And I'm going to um, just do a quick introduction of myself. I know Jeff did a very good job. Um, but before I turn my camera off, just going to give you a little bit of reasoning, I guess, why are the Trees Forever folks talking about prairie? Um, so I know some of you have worked with us over the years and have uh, probably been involved with some of our programs that we have actually funded prairie planting. So it is something that we as a Midwest organization realize is a valuable, um, valuable tool that we need to include in our in our uh, work that we do. And so we do a lot of a lot of work uh, through some of our programs with prairie plantings and uh, uh, looking at existing and restored prairies. So. Um, this is going to be a, a walk through the prairie uh, through the seasons, and so let's get it started. I'm going to get rid of my camera right now, and, and uh, we will start looking at what we have uh, as we move through the prairie and through the, uh, the year. And so initially, well, we have a, a great shot of a landscape uh, prairie on our, our opening slide here, and you see a lot of the colors. This would be more of a a midsummer type, mid to early summer type uh, shot. And so you see a lot of the colors that are showing up there. And we'll talk more about the plants that you're seeing here as we move along. So the first thing I'm gonna put up here is spring. And what we're seeing are, what it look, not so many lovely colors necessarily, but we have one of the main management tools that we uh, encourage folks to use on their uh, restored prairies or existing uh, remnants if they have them and that is fire and uh, i know many of you know that but there are a number of reasons to do this uh, we have encroachment of woody plants that uh, utilizing fire does reduce their their vigor and pushes them back and uh, opening up a site a prairie site uh, in early spring uh, allowing the ground to warm up more quickly allows the prairie plants to get a, a jump start and get going on the year. It also cycles uh, nutrients back uh, into the soil as well um, by taking care of some of that vegetation. So it's a it's a great practice if you can utilize it depending on your site. Obviously there'd be constraints in terms of uh, whether you have uh, com conflicts with existing structures or those types of things, but definitely a tool that we'd like to encourage use. This doesn't always happen ha have to happen in the spring either. For those of you who have prairies, uh, it can happen in the fall. Right now would be a nice time to burn even if you can if you can get it done. Um, and even a little bit earlier in the fall or, or late summer because it benefits different plants by burning at different times of year. So let's get into the plants. What we have here is in, in our area is probably the first plant, flowering plant that shows up in our prairie species, our prairie. And that's the past flower. And uh, you can see it here. It's a lovely early spring plant. Shows up usually in March or very early April. Uh, it has a variation in colors from white to this lavender. And uh, many times if there's snow, you may see uh, snow sitting next to it as it comes into bloom in the spring. So it's a, a very nice plant to have and an early bloomer. Another couple of early bloomers and uh, one in particular that I, I am so happy to see when I get a chance to are the uh, pacoons. On the left, you have the uh, hoary pacoon, and on the right, you have the fringe pacoon. And if you can, you can see on the right, it has a long tubular uh, neck to the flower. And so uh, 
it, there's certain certain species of insects that can utilize that better than others and so uh, there's a um, just a co certain cohort of, of insects that will be able to pollinate this plant but it shows up early uh, probably April and the reason I like the one on the, the left so much is that's a color that must be certainly appealing to me that orange yellowish color is, is uh, very striking and I enjoyed uh, seeing that because it's not very common. Uh, and neither, neither of these plants uh, get much more than a foot tall. So early early spring plants and not typically very tall because they don't need to be. They don't need to be outgrowing the grasses and so forth around them. They have that uh, open space. They have that sunshine hitting them and uh, the grasses haven't overtopped them already. A couple more. Uh, some of the blues that you're seeing, purples and blues that you'll see early in the spring are the prairie flocks and the blue-eyed blue, blue -eyed grass. Um, it's, not it's not a grass. It is actually a, a flowering plant, but it uh, is called blue-eyed grass because the leaves have that grass uh, look to them. So prairie flocks, uh, again, great small uh, prairie plant. And if you have your own planting and you want to include some of the shorter uh, early blooming plants, it would be a great one to utilize. About the same time of year, moving a little bit later, but Shooting Star is going to be out this time of year, and it's one of those plants that um, kind of crosses borders, and, and some of the other ones do as well, uh, crosses ecotype borders. So uh, this will be one that will show up on woodland edges or savannas, uh, but also will do right in, uh, right in some prairie areas as well. So it's um, an early spring flower, uh, again, a shorter flower, uh, but has that nodding um, shooting star, basically, that nodding head, flowering head that uh, is very striking and can range in color. Uh, they're not always white, and I most often see them in more of a pink, pinkish color. On the right, you see the purple prairie clover which is one of the legumes that we find in our prairies and, and actually our prairies commonly have several different types of legumes in them and uh, a great benefit for the prairie because of uh, the nitrogen fixing that legumes do and so this is one of those plants um, it'll start blooming um, maybe may mayish and you're starting to you have that ring of purple flowers starting at the base of that flower uh, stem and and working its way up so you'll have that ring working its way up the, to the top of the that flower um flowering stalk or bud or whatever you want to call it and uh they are fairly common throughout uh the midwest prairies from illinois i know they're very common i know they're quite common in iowa and uh, one of the plants that we utilize many times when we uh, do a restoration and are looking to add a legume to the uh, planting that we're doing. But I can't talk about prairie without talking about grasses, and some of the grasses are really kind of cool or, or interesting to, to include, and we definitely need to include them in any type of planting we do and be aware of them in, in plantings that already exist. They uh, provide a lot of structure in my mind uh, for that whole ecosystem. They provide a lot of rooting mass and also uh, add that vertical structure that helps um, hold up some of the flowering plants and also compete with some of the flowering plants so they don't go crazy. So a couple of types of grasses, so we put them in categories, a couple of types of grasses occur in prairies from the ones we're looking at here, which we call cool season grasses. And then we have ones that we call warm season grasses. And so we'll talk more about those later because they come on later in the year. Cool season grasses are those types of grasses that start greening up early in the spring and will flower in uh, late spring, early summer, earlier than, well, obviously earlier than the warm season grasses, but they uh, per, start filling that niche or that area in the prairie, uh, greening up early and then putting out seed uh, in, in early summer. And so you have two of those here, porcupine grass, or uh, there's also called a needle and thread grass. I think that this is porcupine though. It has a very distinctive seed, a uh, very long seed with a sharp point on it. So may not be something you want to include if you have a lot of uh, small person traffic in, in a, an area that you're planting, but it does have a very distinctive seed head, as well as the June grass, uh, as the name implies, you're seeing that bloom or that seed head forming in June. 
and uh, another one of the cool season grasses that we find in our prairies. A third one is one that's probably more common and probably more recognizable to many folks is the Canada wild rye. Shows up a lot of, that we, in our, a lot of our plantings and a lot of our, our native prairies. It comes on early, so say early uh, plantings, so the first two, three to five years, it's much more common and it'll, it'll continue and persist in a prairie for many, many years, but it is uh, it tends to fade as the other grasses start coming on and out competing it. But it is um, very typical in terms of it has that rye or um, weedish looking seed head. And so uh, in this situation, typically you'll see them nodding off to a side, uh, arching over. And we'll see it later as we go on too. But these are three of the grasses that you know, I would encourage people to utilize, uh, to take a look at, to look for in their prairies when they're out there, they're uh, visiting them uh, in the in the summer, early summer, late spring. And that's where we're at now, late spring into early summer. A couple of the uh, flowers are, this time of year, the flowers are really starting to come on, okay? There's flowers all all seasons, except for probably winter in the, in the prairie, blooming that is. And um, the pollinators are benefiting from this greatly. Bees, uh, bumblebees, uh, insects of all sorts, butterflies, I mean, they, and if you've walked through a prairie, various times of year you've noticed i'm sure you've noticed the different pollinators flying around and so they're very valuable well, these flowers are all very valuable for them what we have here are two of the beard tongues we call them or penstemons um, and the white digitaria one on the left which is a smaller flower probably an inch to an inch and a half long and then you have the large flowered beard tongue on the on the right which is more of a purple or a light lavender which will have a, a flower that's probably two to three inches. Uh, that tube itself will be two to three inches. So very distinctive flowers, kind of fun to see, um, and it's and it's uh, a great asset in your prairie. All right, I'm going to talk a little bit about red, and we have a few flowers, um, two or three that I know of, that are red in our prairies. Uh, this one is Royal Catchfly. Uh, it's a color that we don't often see in the prairies, and so it's. Uh, so it really stands out uh, when you do find it. Royal catchfly, for those of you in eastern Iowa, Illinois, is more common in your area, uh, something that we typically uh, don't have out here in western Iowa, which is sad in a way, but uh, that's the way things shake out. So um, royal, the, the red is, is quite spectacular, and it really draws, um, again, the shape of the flower. It's a fairly deep flower, and so it it needs to be pollinated by butterflies or even hummingbirds, which are attracted to the red color. And uh, is really kind of interesting that uh, it is um, found, or interesting that uh, those are the types of, of animals and critters that need to, to pollinate it, uh, and that it specifically set itself up to do that. Um, on the picture on the left, I wanted to point out a couple of things. This is obviously, so we talk about gradations of different species showing up in the prairie from east to west a little bit. And what we're seeing here, this is, in my mind, is more of an eastern site uh, also because of, uh, you see the purple cone flower there, which is the common Echinacea purpurea, um, which is very commonly sold in the nursery industry, as well as um, you see it planted an awful lot. And it is, primarily native uh, to the eastern part of our state and into Illinois, uh, that part of the prairie region. And as we move it west in the state, it's not found uh, as often. And so we bring in the pale purple coneflower, and we'll see that in a little bit. But this is more of an eastern shot. So you have the purple coneflower, you have the royal catchfly, which are more eastern species, and then you have uh, yellow coneflower, a lot of yellow coneflower there. In the far right picture you have the royal catchfly that somebody looked like planted by their garden fence and right next to it is another one of the yellow flowers we see this time of year and that's black eyed susan and that's uh you can see a little bit different the the purple comb flower on the or excuse me the yellow comb flower on the left has more reflexed petals much longer more airy black eyed susan is a little more dense and, and uh, compact and here's our pale purple cone flower Okay, so this is one that occurs across the state, but it is, you see that the 
the petals are much narrower, more reflexed, really hanging back down. Um, and so it's it's common across our state. It's a common across both Illinois and Iowa uh, throughout the Midwest. And uh, it's just not as, uh, we don't just have the pale, or excuse me, the purple cone flower in this part of the, the world. Uh, spiderwort is another one that's common throughout. Uh, there's a couple different kinds. This is um, Ohio spiderwort. And I love this plant. It's it grows very well as a specimen plant in your garden, if you like, as you're seeing here by this fence. Um, it does well in your prairie. And it has these lovely bluish purple blooms that continue throughout the summer for a month. And they're not the same bloom every time. They, they put on a new bloom fairly regularly. And interestingly, as the, the heat of the day comes about, all the flowers will close up. So it's, it's um, a fun plant to watch and to include in your landscape. A couple of the others we're seeing in the summer, um, one very common one to the right there, the uh, bee balm, bergamot, uh, monarda, whatever you want to call it, um, is very common in early prairie plantings. It is uh, well used by pollinators, hence the name bee balm, and it is a great asset for, for them in the prairie as well. One that is a little less known is the Monarda on the left, which is a Monarda punctata, and it is uh, found more in, in drier or sandy areas, uh, but it is also native to this, this uh, part of the world. And um, <clears throat> both of these plants, they're mints, so um, you can tell that a couple ways when you're out there checking out plants in your prairie. They have square stems, so as you feel the stem, you'll feel that it's square, but you also, if you pluck a leaf and crush it in your fingers, uh, you'll get a, a scent from them as well. So a couple of ways to tell what this plant is. Uh, and it's just kind of fun to have something other than a visual cue uh, to determine what you're looking at, to have that scent to work with it as well. Now we talk about prairies, we talk about diversity, and, and that's a very important thing um, in any type of planting from my perspective, because diversity allows for color changes, for blooming time changes, for height differences throughout the season and, and different animals and different pollinators and, and a variety of, of things benefit from those types of changes. And so what we have here are white, which is a common color uh, that we see a lot in the prairie, but there's three different plants and there are uh, three different uh, statures. So the, the one on the far left is a nodding onion probably only gets to be about a foot, foot and a half, maybe at the most in height. So it'll be lower toward the ground and it uh, is providing that white flower. Um, and actually has some edible parts to it as well. Uh, in the center there, you have wild quinine, um, another white flower with a, an umbel. You see that flat flower um, head holding itself up there and it is probably gonna be in the three to four foot tall range. And on the far right, you have, uh, come on, white, the, the white baptisia, the white indigo, uh, and it is uh, <clears throat> gonna have that flower stalk sticking up at least three feet, if not four or five feet. Uh, very spectacular in the prairie during the uh, early summer, midsummer, and it is uh, one, another one of the legumes out there. So it is also, again, another, another nitrogen fixture, fixer, and is uh, providing that asset to our prairie as well. A couple more whites, just kind of more in a overall uh, prairie scene. One of the plants I, that is very striking and um, memorable for me is the uh, rattlesnake master. And you'll see a couple of those here in the picture, but in the, the easiest one to tell is in the far uh, lower right-hand corner, that is the seed head or flower head, I should say, of the rattlesnake master. And so it has a white flower. That ball is a whole cluster of flowers and they're all blooming at this point. And it'll change to kind of a, a green brown as the season goes on, but it's a very striking uh, seed head that you see and we'll be able to notice throughout the prairie as the seasons change. Uh, behind that is another white that we see a lot in the prairie that's called Culver's root, that white spike. And it is uh, 
utilized a lot. It also ha it has a distinctive uh, leafing uh, pattern or they're, they're whirled around the stem as opposed to alternating or opposite to each other, but there's a whirl of leaves. And so it's another distinctive characteristic to tell uh, what kind of plant it is. Now, everybody knows what these are, I'm guessing. These are a uh, grouping of four pictures of milkweeds. <clears throat> and milkweeds have gotten a lot of press over the last few years, uh, simply, be, well, mainly because of the monarchish, monarch concerns. And so I press that they deserve, press that we need to continue because uh, if we're providing uh, assets for monarchs to survive and thrive, it's providing benefits to all the other insects that are helpful for us as well. So uh, just kind of a rundown of, of what we're seeing here. I know many of you know what they are, but on the upper left-hand corner is a swamp milkweed. On the lower left-hand corner is probably the most uh, sought after and popular orange plant in the prairie, uh, butterfly milkweed. And then uh, on the lower right-hand corner is common milkweed, which you know, very beneficial for monarchs, one of their favorite milkweeds. And then on the upper right-hand corner, I haven't actually identified exactly what it is. Um, yellow is not a common color for any of the, uh, the milkweeds, although I know there are some cultivars out there that have uh, taken butterfly milkweed and uh, selected for the yellow cultivar. And I have actually seen butterfly milkweed in uh, uh, a prairie that was yellow um, and it was a it was a remnant that was yellow but the leaf on this throws me off so i'm not certain if it's uh if it's just the angle and it's and it's a butterfly and you just can't see it but um it could be another cultivar as well but again uh even if it is a cultivar the value of somebody putting it out in their landscape to benefit native insects is is um they may not be thinking about that but that is a value that uh we are we are all gaining from that planting all right so i hit another color and we're going to talk about a couple more of the the prominent um, prairie flowering plants that we have and uh, a couple that are are you know many of you will know and things that we want to include in our prairies when we're when we're planting them so on the i'm going to start on the far left with the blazing star um, prairie blazing star in this case there are many different kinds of blazing stars. Um, this would be Pycnostacea, I believe, which is considered the prairie blazing star. There are things like Spicata, which is shorter than this, but just the profusion of that lavender uh, color in this section of the prairie is, is striking. Uh, you get this beautiful purple color. Um, many times you'll have a lot of them all blooming at the same time, and it is, it is just fun to see and, and very enjoyable to be out there at that time. On the left, you have lead plant, which is uh, to me a very interesting plant um, <clears throat> because I, the flower is, I guess for some reason, some of those flowers just stand out to me, but it has a really dark purple color and then the anthers are orange and that really uh, makes it stand out to me. This plant also has a compound leaf, so you see those deeply dissected leaves that are kind of silvery in color or, or maybe a lead color. Um, and it is one of the uh, shrubs that we have in the prairie. This is actually a woody plant. And uh, many times you won't see it as a shrub because it, it gets dies back on a yearly basis, typically because of, um, the weather is cold around here. And uh, many times fires will burn it back, but it, it survives well and does well in our, our prairies throughout the Midwest. So we're talking a lot about flowers, which are the things that really draw us in when we look at prairies, but uh, grasses are uh, cool. <laughs> Just we need, we need to include grasses and, and they're fun to uh, look at. Maybe their beauty is a little more subtle than the, uh, the flowers. And so that's maybe something that uh, some of us are drawn to. But what, we're, what I'm moving into now are the grasses that we would call warm season grass. So I talked about cool season grasses earlier, but these are the warm season grasses. They are the ones that um, will be blooming later in the fall, or excuse me, will be going to seed later in the fall and they'll be blooming during the summer. So um, they will come on later. A lot of times, well, at least 
initially when I started working with prairies, uh, they were promoted as a late season forage for grazers because they are adapted to uh, growing later into the season. So this is something to think about um, as part of your prairie planting as well. But what we have here are the seed heads of two uh, fairly common prairie plants, uh, C4 gra or warm season grasses. The one is probably the most common, most well-known prairie grass uh, that we, we talk about, and that's the big blue stem on the right-hand side, right-hand picture there. And you see that distinctive seed head, which many people refer to as a turkey foot, uh, has the multiple, looks like long toes sticking up in the air. And that is big blue stem. Uh, it is ubiquitous. I mean, it's when you talk about mesic prairies or common prairies, it is the, the grass that you would always, always include in that planting mix because it is something that uh, was here and is here and is, is very important to that, that species mix. On the uh, left is a more um, subtle, let's say, grass, um, much smaller. It grows maybe up to two feet uh, with the seed head, and that's side oats grandma. And hence, you can see from the, the way the seeds are hanging on the, uh, the branch, side oats is pretty uh, characteristic or pretty, uh, I can't, words are hard sometimes. But anyhow, the thing I like about side oats is the fact that um, if you catch it right, it produces a little red flower out of each of those little uh, seed heads there, you'll have a little red flower. And for grass, it's a very attractive uh, flower. And it's kind of cool to be able to, to find that in your prairie and to point it out to folks because everybody sees the big pretty flowers, but not everybody sees the grasses blooming. Another one of the, the warm season grasses that uh, gets used quite a lot simply be, for one of the reasons being that it is uh, very attractive and gets used uh, as a border planting or in more of a manicured type setup. As you can see, uh, prairie drop seed has a very fine um, mound of, of leaves. And so it's very uh, nice to include in any of your plantings because it forms that soft look on the edge and a, and a nice distinctive uh, border to those types of plantings. It also will go to seed, which is most plants will, obviously, uh, but it produces a seed head that gets probably about two feet tall. So it's not a very tall grass either uh, in terms of as it relates to like big blue stem that can get to six feet tall. So that soft look uh, is, is something that's desirable for many people as they're doing more of a, a manicured or um, flower bed type planting. So that we kind of went through summer and summer just is a profusion of flowers and grasses coming on, just going crazy. And now we're moving into the fall and we're starting to see the colors change and we're gonna start to stop seeing as many things blooming. But I need to point out at this point, um, I borrowed a couple slides and I got with permission. And so the person who these slides came from are Lance Brevoy who is with Golden Hills RC and D, and I'll talk a little bit more about him in the, in the future. But this is a shot in the Lus Hills of Western Iowa. And so I have a few more of those. They're just kind of cool shots to see how the landscape is rolling there. And, and uh, as I live in central Iowa, uh, west central Iowa, we don't have a whole lot of this kind of hill, but um, it's kind of nice to see. But it, as you can see, it's a nice change moving into fall. We're getting some color coming in. So. As we get into fall, many of the plants that are flowering at this point yet are now in the purple and yellow color range. We see a, a lot of purples and yellows. And so it's the sunflower time. It's the, uh, the liatris are still blooming. Um, we're seeing a lot of those colors at this point. Uh, a lot of the asters are coming on that will be uh, purple like New England aster or sky blue aster that'll be a more of a blue. Those kind of things are all coming in this time of year. Uh, and so the golden rods and the sunflowers are really happening uh, as well. So just kind of walk you through what we have here on the far left is stiff goldenrod, that uh, great golden color, different, a little bit different look from many of the other goldenrods. Along the top there in the center is ironweed, uh, nice deep purple. And uh, on the far 
right? I'm guessing everybody knows what that is, but that's compass plant uh, with the cut leaf look on the bottom and then the, the flower spike that shoots up, you know, eight, 10 feet in the air. And below that are many, are many of the other yellow flowers. So we have, I'm guessing a lot of, uh, sh oh, come on, Brad. The uh, Heliopsis helianthoides, the oxide, uh, sun, the uh, false sunflowers are showing up there. And then uh, in the bottom center, uh, we have showy tick trefoil, another purple pink flower. This can get to be five, six feet tall. And these are the, the guys that give you the little stick tights that carry you carry out with you as you're leaving the prairie this time of year as they're uh, going to seed. So late summer, we get a lot of purples and, and, and golds and yellows and uh, just kind of a fun way to look at the prairie. Uh, some of the grasses are starting to get a nice look to them as well. Indian grass is one of my uh, favorites of this because of the, the golden colored seed head that they form. They get, when they're, they're going, when they're flowering, they have kind of a yellow flower on the seed head. And as it matures, it gets this golden yellow color and the, uh, is really a nice addition to your prairie as well as um, could be a very attractive landscape plant too because it forms a really dense clump um, and stays pretty manageable. It doesn't doesn't go real crazy, so it could be a nice height variation. It's, it'll be uh, a four to five foot tall grass, and so a lot of times when you're seeing these miscanthus or whatever whatever Carl Forrester stuff that people are putting in their landscapes I think of this one as a substitute for something like that and little blue stem is another one I, I uh, like seeing in the landscape uh, for a number of reasons it is uh, gets you kind of that bluish color in this during its growing season then you have the reds as you move into the fall this is actually one of the my favorite grasses in terms of fall color I think it produces a really nice red and if you can catch it right when the seed when the seed heads are are still on it has that fluffy white seed and so it's just spectacular uh if you get a frost on this it's it's a a great shot and it's, it's a great experience to be able to see that uh, out of the landscape at that, this time of year so again that's another nice landscape shot what we're seeing here though um you know subtle changes in color but it's a bright red running through there and that bright red is sumac and many of you go sumac i don't want sumac and and many people don't want sumac but it provides a great color in the early fall <clears throat> and as we move into into the winter um, and as they manage this prairie it may get reduced more and more because uh, if you're managing with a burn it'll it'll continue to knock it back but it is something that is native to this landscape and so if you can manage it it does provide a uh, really nice fall color and you see the variations in in uh, browns and, and reds as we're moving through this landscape right here and, uh, another lance lance Brevoy picture and then i just wanted to talk about a couple of other plants that um they're not necessarily in the order that the that i they could be in there although the the one in the center, okay, I'm gonna start there. That's Lance, whose pictures I have borrowed. <clears throat> and he is standing by a plant that I was surprised to see out in Western Iowa because I didn't realize that it actually existed there or didn't know if it was in its range. And so um, some of you, I'm gonna let you kind of look at a little bit more, but the, the leaf of that plant is just to the right of it. Uh, it is a basal leaf. It is a large heart-shaped leaf. Uh, it is a cousin to rosin, rosin weed and um, cup plant and compass plant. So it's one of the sylphiums and this is this plant is prairie dock. And I first uh, became aware of met this plant or whatever, how you wanna look at it was when I was in graduate school in Wisconsin. So um, my understanding at the time was that it got into maybe Eastern Iowa, but not to Western Iowa. And where we are in this picture is, is Pottawatomie County, which is the county, one of the furthest Western counties in the state. So um, this is a reconstructed road, roadside planting, whether it um, became in the seed mix or not, I don't know how it got there, but it was a spectacular plant. Uh, that flower stalk is probably reaching 12 feet into the air. 
I mean, that that's just amazing. It, uh, it's just fun to see. And, and if you look at this one in comparison to compass plant, most of that flowering stock is naked in terms of leaves. Uh, just the flowers are coming out on it. So it's, it's a fun, it was a fun plant to find and uh, just uh, kind of a, a question mark for me as to how it got to that point. Another plant that to me is, is kind of fun, uh, especially late in the fall, is bottle gentian. And that's what you're seeing to the far left there. It is a purple blue or whatever color you want to call it. To me, it's a purple blue. Um, it is a short plant. So uh, interestingly, a lot of times we see the plants, the flowering plants get taller with the grasses so they can, they can compete for the sunlight and so forth. But this plant is a smaller plant, um, maybe up to a foot occurs in the prairie in September and October when it's, is when it's blooming. And you're seeing the flowers as far open as they get. The interesting thing to me about this plant is it is specifically wanting a bumblebee to, to pollinate it. Um, that, is about, that is the only insect strong enough to open up that flower to get inside to get to the nectar. And there has to be a benefit for that and, and maybe it's something to the lines that um, nothing else can get in there and get the nectar and so the bumblebee knows it shows up there it's got a, a ready food source i don't know but it's just kind of fun to see that the plants have evolved with the insects and they're focusing on i'm bringing bumblebees here they're going to pollinate me and that's the only the only ones i'm focusing on so kind of a unique plant in that way so as we all know, it's the end of, no well, actually it's December now, isn't it? So there'll be snow coming and there's frost in the mornings. And so um, if you have a prairie nearby, uh, sometimes you get to see these wonderful seed heads covered with frost or snow capped. And so what we're seeing over here on the left-hand side, I talked about the rattlesnake master earlier in the, in the presentation here, and we're seeing it nice with a, uh, frosting on it in the winter. A very distinctive seed head again. I was unable to do that for this year, but uh, many times uh, my wife will make a, a uh, centerpiece for the Thanksgiving table, which we didn't have much of a Thanksgiving this year, not many people. And so we'll bring in a variety of different things. And this would be one that would, we would bring in as a as part of that, that uh, centerpiece type design. So uh, a cool plant to have in your prairie as well as uh, to bring in your house in the winter. Another couple with the frost on them, uh, we talked about the uh, Canada wild rye and that's what you're seeing over on the right, right hand side. The uh, seed head basically without the seed on it anymore, but it has frost on it which makes it uh, stand out and, and gives it a lovely uh, look right now. And then also a common goldenrod over to the left. You know, things with frost on them just look cool. And so that's kind of what we're seeing uh, happening throughout the winter. So, so take the time to get out and take a look at these things, uh, especially on those mornings when you see there's a frost that has uh, hit the plants and, and go take a look at them and, and get some cool shots. So that kind of wraps up my talk. Um, I'm going to uh, hit a couple of things that we have coming up just to get just to get you thinking about them if you want to join us again because we'd love to have you join us again uh, it's great to be able to do these things and and uh, speak with folks uh, get you be able to print, present some of these ideas to folks so basically coming up in january on the 12th we're doing another webinar again at noon uh, on creating a backyard buzz so more discussion about how you could actually uh, plant these types of things in your yard and um, attract, attract pollinators. And then uh, on January 26th, again, same time, we're doing a pruning workshop, or webinar, I should say, uh, trees and shrubs. And so uh, another opportunity to learn a few things about pruning, and this is a good time of year to start thinking about pruning right now uh, as we move into the winter and then into the spring. And then lastly, um, we have Stewards of the Beautiful Land again, starting in May and June. Some of you may have been involved with that. It's a series of educational uh, trainings online and then uh, also outside events where we do uh, management, planting, and um, just visits to prairie areas and woodland areas to uh, learn the species. And so that picture you saw with Lance on there was one of those, those nights that we did this past year. 
And just lastly, oh my gosh. So lastly, I just want to mention that um, we are, it is Giving Tuesday. And for many of you, uh, I know you do give to your charity of choice or your organization of nonprofit organization of choice, but I wanted to put it out there and say that there's uh, there's an opportunity for everybody to uh, be involved and uh, I'd like to see um, folks take advantage of Giving Tuesday. And with that, thank you very much and enjoy the winter as we move into another year. Hopefully things start shaking out for us. But again, thank you all for joining. And if we have any questions, we'll get to that. I'll thank you, Brad. You. Uh, excellent presentation. Uh, so if folks have any questions, be sure to type them in the questions box for us. Um, if you don't have any questions, excellent. Uh, we have good students. So the quiz will be coming shortly. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no and, and, and I appreciate you, everybody, being on. It's been wonderful. Uh, it's nice to see people involved and joining us. So it gives me a chance to dig out all the prayer pictures, too, folks. No questions, well, Jeff? Not yet. The picture is worth a thousand words, that's for sure. Actually, check your questions box. Maybe because you're the presenter, they're going to you. Uh, I, don't, I don't have any, so that's fine. That's totally fine. It was My hope was that it was somewhat, you know, something you could do just to kind of chill over your lunch hour. So I, oh, we have a question that came through from uh, Jean. Hi, Jean. Uh, she said, we need to know <clears throat> where to get questions. Um, Oh, here we go. Okay. Little red button on the far right side. Uh, <laughs> Rachel. Hi, Rachel. Uh, Rachel says, I've been working on a small pollinator garden that has a lot of uh, these plants, but I found an invasive grass that came in with some compost. Do you have a recommendation for getting rid of it? Okay. Rachel, um, depending on how large your site is, um, and whether you can manage how you can manage it there's lots of things to think about if it's next to say a building or a fence or something i'm guessing burning is out um, so it may be a hand removal type thing or if you're uh, comfortable uh, a small application of a herbicide uh, broad spectrum herbicide maybe but uh, you know you might try just the the hand management depending on how large your site is um, and and some things we have issues with in terms of if you do burn sometimes it may invigorate some of those grasses too that are, are an invasive so i would if you can burn i would burn and then check to see how it does the following year and if it's reduced that's a great way to continue if it's not reduced then you probably need to start looking at uh, more intensive management by hand or or addressing it with an herbicide of some sort that's 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 the best I can come up with. I apologize. That's as good as it gets, I think, from my standpoint. So we have another question here. Uh, where do you get prairie plants? Some of the plants that you perhaps talked about, Brad, um, are, are there areas where you can actually buy potted plants or are there other options? Yeah, lots of them. So, um, boy, there's lots of nurseries out there. I guess I'm going to ask you, Jeff, too. Do we have that information on our website? Because well, through the stewards program, we did have a list. Let, um, let's start with uh, the basics in terms of uh, if, if you're looking for potted plants, so yeah. this would be in gallon pots, uh, you're probably going to be limited. There's no doubt about it. There's, there isn't a whole lot of retail places that will have a lot of these uh, native prairie plants. Now, there are some native prairie seed dealers that also do some plugs or plants. Mm -hmm. um, I should have started off. Plugs is uh, pots are the biggest. As you go down, you can get plugs. So these are smaller uh, seedlings, uh, if I can like use the thumb term. Thumb size. Right. Yeah. Thumb size. And then, of course, there's just direct seeding where we're going to spread that seed and let come up what may. Um, so plugs are going to be, would you say, more or less readily available from some of the native seed producers, Brad? Well, yeah, there's some that do a lot of plugs. So I, I think of some names, and I'm not trying to promote anybody in particular, but I know Ion Exchange up in Northeast Iowa does a lot of plugs. So they're gonna be in a flat of like 84 of thumb size type things. But I know there are other nurseries that do that kind of thing as well. I worked with a nurse, uh, a plant grower in central Iowa 
uh, just recently that did two inch pots. You know, there's there's a variety of different ways to get these things. I'm sure Prairie Moon up in, in Southwest Minnesota does them well. Um, so some of the larger growers will do that. And actually some of the seed growers will actually um, contract grow things for you. So if you wanted certain things, they will contract grow out things for you. Um, what Incidentally, is, uh, what Brad's yeah. referencing in terms of a document is um, uh, the Tallgrass Prairie Center puts out a list of contractors and then seed providers, producers. And so mm -hmm. that document is on the Tallgrass Prairie website. We also include it in our pollinator uh, toolkit found on our Trees Forever website. Uh, if you were to do a search for pollinator toolkit, Trees Forever website, uh, you would come across a wealth of information, which would include the link then for the Tallgrass Prairie. But if you want to skip that step and just go right to the Tallgrass Prairie Center, that's fine as well. But that's where you could certainly find uh, a listing of those producers, uh, those providers, as well as contractors. Yeah, and so that's going to be primarily for Iowa. But um, I'm sure Illinois has something similar, but that's uh, typically where we're working. So thank you. For Brad, we've got another question here. Uh, can you describe differences or reasons why a spring burn versus a fall burn? Okay, yeah. So um, spring burns, how is this explained to me? Um, spring burns tend to benefit, uh, let's see. What are we looking at? The grasses. There's, oh boy, I knew I should have looked this up a little bit better. Tom Rostrum, okay. on a walk with him, it's like he is promoting things like burning late summer because it actually benefits, well, so for instance, so the early spring bloomers, if we're burning in the spring, it impacts them negatively, okay? So if you wanna see more of the types of things like the past flower, the phlox, the pacoons, those kind of things working in, if you planted them and you're not seeing them, maybe burning in the late summer or into the fall, uh, it's gonna benefit them more because now you're not impacting them when they're starting to grow. And so that's um, one of the things that uh, he has talked about a lot is that many of our historic fires happened in the late summer and, and fall because that's when we had lightning storms and so forth and, and so, uh, changing up that regime of when you burn actually benefits a uh, different cohort of plants that you're looking at on your prairie. So again, early spring bloomers, if you burn in the spring, it's going to impact them negatively. We had a comment here from Hannah Grimm. Uh, she mentioned, just going back one uh, question previous, check your local greenhouses as well for native plants. Uh, she purchased some gallon-sized native plants at a local mom and pop shop in North Sioux City. Uh, oh, we do Ooh. have a couple of Western Iowa folks here. Welcome, yeah. <laughs> uh, so that's another great, uh, great answer there. You can sometimes find it at uh, your local. And of course, we'll want to shop locally if we can. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. Another question here. Um, it looks like, do we have um, options for edibles for humans? Are there native edibles that we could grow edible for people, that is? And uh, my immediate, uh, my mind goes immediately to the uh, Indian reference uh, book that tells all of the native plants and what the Indians once used them for, or Native Americans that survived off of the land. Mm -hmm. um, but I can't um, pinpoint that right now. Brad, any thoughts? Are the nodding onions? Uh, yeah, they're edible. edible. I, th I think you could actually use them like a scallion. Um, I don't know that they produce a lot of a ball, but they do. You can use them like a scallion uh, type of thing. So cut, a, cut up the green tops. Um, there is, so the, oh my God, Prairie Plants of Iowa books came out back well, a long time ago with Dean Rosa and Sylvan Runkel. Um, and they have a whole section in each one of them about what the uses were uh, by the Native Americans or, or the pioneers as they came in. So there's there's a, a little section of un, under each plant that talks about that use. And so if you can find something on that book, uh, it's Wild, uh, I think it's Wildflowers of Iowa, I think is the name of it. But it's uh, the the uh, authors were Sylvan Runkel and, and Dean Rusa. So I know that there's options out there to look these things up. Um, I don't have to, I don't, I don't know a lot about which ones are edible. 
I do know there's a nut that's edible that we can grow, uh, hazelnuts, but that's a whole different thing, Jeff. This is a prairie presentation, Brad. You're not going to get me started talking about nuts. So we've got another question here about an invasive. And so this is actually a pretty common question, so I think we should definitely take a stab at it. Um, mm -hmm. A specific invasive that they're struggling with is reed canary grass. Oh uh, do you gosh. have any recommendations or specific treatments to eradicate it? Um, and notice that he used the term eradicate, which is a pretty high bar. Ooh, very high <laughs> bar. Manage or control is uh, something we might uh, be a first baby step. Well, I guess, oh my goodness, this is one of those tough, uh, crazy things. I would try to kill it over and over and over for a number of years before I planted anything. Um, and killing it, depending on how large of a patch size it is, could just simply be smothering. It could be, um, you know, putting, it's probably not a great use, but if you have old carpet, you know, covering that site up with old carpet, just kill it, smother it out. Uh, I've had people remove six to eight inches of the sod or the soil, uh, because what you have a lot of times um, is, even if you kill the existing vegetation, you have a huge seed bed or seed bank that's still there. So you still need to address that. So it's a number of years type of thing um, where you could try a chemical treatment. Uh, but many times these are in a wet area and so you your uh, options are, are smaller. Um, and so you have to be aware of that as well. It's a very difficult uh, one to deal with, um, but it takes, it takes persistence. It, I haven't seen anybody get rid of it after a year and then know that it's probably going to come back because it's already in your region. And so there's many, many seed sources, especially if you're along a, a wet, uh, a river system or a stream system that uh, you get seed carried down uh, very easily. So once you have addressed that existing planting, and this somewhat address the seed bank, you're still gonna have some calm, I'm sure. But if you can get a vigorous planting in there of probably primarily native grasses is what I would look at, because you're gonna to wanna to try to take up those sites that, um, that the reed canary grass has been utilizing. So I would hit it hard with a heavy grass mix um, and, and work from there. Uh, you know, best you can. It's it's a tough one, and I don't have a definitive answer. Sorry. Well, I would just um, my suggestion is, as Brad said, everything right here. You could also just Google reed controlling reed canary grass in Iowa. Um, there's a lot of great references in in Iowa and in Minnesota. There's been a lot of research done on different herbicide treatments. Uh, sequencing is one thing that the that's talked about a lot where. We try to go in there with a prescribed burn and then come back with a glyphosate application or maybe a different herbicide application. Uh, I know some guys that uh, try to graze it as hard as they can to keep it in check, um, but it's it's really a multi-pronged attack, I think, uh, when we're dealing with something like that that's just so invasive and so vigorous. So, um, sorry, we couldn't have a better definitive answer for you. <laughs> but, uh, Wouldn't that so we be have great? Another question. Do we, uh, we have a question about high forb content pollinator seed mixes also work well for pheasant and quail cover. And uh, as a pheasant hunter myself, the answer is yes. Uh, so what the, the birds are in there for is uh, certainly structure and habitat, but to eat insects and other things like that. So the more diversity we have in, in wildflower species, the more diversity we have in insects. And so um, those stiff stemmed forbs are great for quail and pheasant habitat as well. I concur. <laughs> well, someone asked here, um, in terms of some of these native plants, why do we always see um, garden centers carry mostly the common purple cone flower rather than the pale purple cone flower? Boy, very good question. I think, I guess it's been uh, selected and from my standpoint this is what I see and this is just me speculating um, but from what I see it's been bred and cultivated and um, selected to grow it's more of a compact 
um, showy type flower that you're going to find in, in most garden type plantings. I mean, they, they set it up so it grows maybe two feet tall and it has a really compact or a nice size flower on top of that uh, with the seed head. So it's, it's very attractive, but it's been selected for that type of thing. Where pale purple coneflower, um, in my mind, may be more of a, um, a taste thing. You're, you're just, you know it's valuable, you know it's great, but it has, it doesn't, it's not quite as distinctive and uh, showy as, as the purple coneflower. And so it's, it's as, as with many things in garden centers and tree nurseries, and, and I'm not saying anything wrong, they need to move a product. And so um, something that's a bit more showy is gonna move better than, um, than a pale purple coneflower. But if you go to some of these native nurseries, they're gonna definitely have it available. Excellent, it's, it's, excellent, yeah. Well, we're coming up to the end of the hour here. Um, we have held on to most folks here that have stuck around. <laughs> That's for pretty day. amazing. <laughs> um, and, and if there are any final questions, certainly uh, fire them off to us here. Otherwise, I think we're going to go ahead and wrap up. I just want to remind folks that this will be recorded and eventually will be uh, on our webinar library. Uh, you can access that when you go to the webinar page. Uh, of our Trees Forever website. And on the right-hand side, in kind of a, a beige box, it'll say something about uh, click here to access our past webinars or our webinar library. Uh, once you click that link, you'll um, be mystically transported into <laughs> a virtual library where you can see all sorts of webinars from previous Creating a Backyard Buzz to an introduction to Trees Forever programming, uh, to uh, Bird Friendly Iowa, which we just did here recently. So check that out, certainly. Um, want to thank everyone for joining us and um, happy holidays. Yes, thank you very much. Bye.